you should just rent a cheap apartment and live there. After all, someone who just plays around at home doesn't deserve to live in this house, said Susan, who had returned from the city. She was now attempting to drive me out of the house where I was living with my in-laws, planning to take my place. My in-laws who don't understand working from home, and my husband who wants to take the house from me, are all siding with my sister-in-law, Susan. Together with Susan, my husband Mark and in-laws keep blaming me. Do they even realize who is paying for this house's mortgage? That's when it struck me. If I left, who would pay the monthly mortgage of $4,600? There's no reason for me to continue living with these people who make me feel so terrible. If they want me to leave, then I'll leave. I've endured enough and finally my anger has reached its peak. I'll change the ownership and mortgage to your name, I told my husband. With that, I divorced my overjoyed husband Mark and left the house. Little did they know, they would soon face an unexpected situation. My name is Emily. I used to live with my husband Mark, who is two years older than me. I met Mark while working at a company. However, it wasn't the typical office romance, as Mark was working for the cleaning company that serviced my office. When I met my husband, I had just lost both of my parents in quick succession. First, my father was diagnosed with an illness, and the doctors gave him only three months to live. While caring for him, my mother fell ill too, and despite her fight, they both passed away, leaving me alone. Having no siblings, I suddenly found myself all by myself, struggling to accept the reality that my parents were gone. After their passing, I would often find myself thinking of them at random moments and tearing up. However, I tried to hide my feelings from those around me who were being considerate. I think I forced myself to smile all the time while at work. The first time my husband Mark spoke to me I was trying not to let anyone notice as I stood in the hallway during a break, staring blankly outside the window, lost in thoughts of my parents. I had seen Mark at work before and we had exchanged nods but we had never spoken and I didn't even know his name. Yet Mark approached me as I looked out the window and asked, are you okay? You seem a bit down. In response to my husband Mark's gentle inquiry, I found myself talking about my parents. Maybe it was easier because he was a stranger whose name I didn't even know. When Mark heard about my parents passing, he sympathized, saying he was close to his own parents and could understand the loneliness. I was glad that Mark listened to my story. After that, we started having brief conversations whenever we saw each other. We saw each other at work and it didn't take long before we started meeting outside of work. Soon after we started dating, Mark introduced me to his parents. As Mark had mentioned, he seemed to have a good relationship with them. His parents, aware of my loss, were considerate and invited me to visit them anytime. I quickly grew close to my in-laws, and without a formal proposal, it naturally led to me marrying Mark. After the wedding, we rented an apartment near my in-laws and started our life together. After getting married, I quit my job and switched to a company that allowed me to work fully remotely from home. I did this considering the possibility of having children with Mark in the future. I told Mark about my career change, but it seems he didn't quite understand it. For now, he just knows that I work from home using my computer. Since my salary didn't change after switching jobs, I decided to take care of the living expenses. Mark earned less than I did, so we agreed that I would pay for our expenses while Mark would save his salary, except for what he spent on social activities. Mark didn't have any expensive hobbies, and before we got married, his social expenses were mostly just dates with me or going out with friends. Mark himself said he was okay with me managing our savings, so this is how we handled our finances. Working from home was all positive for me. Above all, I was happy that I could enjoy leisurely meals with Mark when he came home. This wouldn't have been possible if I were still working at my previous company. Before we got married, I often made simple meals just for myself, but now, Wanting to please Mark, I find myself wanting to cook more elaborate dishes. Our life together was passing by peacefully. Then, a few years into our marriage, something shocking happened. My in-law's house was completely destroyed in a fire. Fortunately, my in-laws were unharmed, but they lost not only all their possessions, but also irreplaceable memories, like photo albums. For a while, my in-laws stayed in our apartment, and they were deeply upset. 
I wanted to cheer them up, as they had helped me heal from the loss of my own parents, so I did everything I could to care for them. I cooked of course, and also took care of the household chores during breaks from work, making sure they felt comfortable. On weekends, Mark and I would go out with them. However, my in-laws were conscious of being a burden, and struggled to regain their usual cheerfulness. They often mentioned that they couldn't stay with us forever, and were concerned about imposing on us. So, my husband Mark and I decided to build a house to live with my in-laws. Until now, my in-laws had never brought up the idea of living together, but in one way or another, Mark and I had been considering it. In preparation, I had been saving from my salary separate from the savings my husband was making. Thinking it was better to get a mortgage sooner rather than later, I suggested that we use this opportunity to build a house. My in-laws were delighted, and the conversation quickly came to an agreement. The house they had lived in was a charming wooden structure built by my great-grandfather. It had been fine when they were younger, but as they aged, they started experiencing various health issues. Therefore, they had many requests for the new house. Mark II wanted to add various features, thinking that if we were going to build it, we might as well do it right. Ultimately, the cost ended up being much higher than anticipated. Still, convincing myself that we would be living there for a long time, I agreed to build a house that met all three of their requests. I began to sense something was off around this time. Mark was excessively claiming to his parents, Karen and John, that he was the one building the house, and they were constantly thanking only him. Even though the house and the mortgage were in my name, the down payment came from my savings, but it seemed like Mark hadn't mentioned this to Karen and John at all. Perhaps because of Mark's insistent claims that it was his house, Karen and John started pressuring me to thank Mark as well. I do appreciate Mark not just for the financial aspect. I paid more because I was able to, not because I wanted gratitude from Mark or Karen and John. However, even when Karen and John said such things to me, Mark didn't stand up for me. Instead, he jokingly said, That's right, you should be grateful to me for letting you live in a new house. I was definitely upset after being repeatedly told falsehoods. I understand that Mark has his pride, so I didn't ask him to tell his parents the entire truth. But I did ask him to stop making it seem like I was doing nothing. However, Mark, perhaps feeling more confident because of our new house construction, just wouldn't listen. And then I found out that Mark was telling a terrible lie to his parents. Incredibly, he told them he worked at the same company where I used to work. The company I worked for is considered a well-known major corporation. True, Mark still has dealings with that company. But as I began to notice Mark's lies and his inflated pride, I started to feel increasingly distrustful of him. I also felt uncomfortable because his parents always seemed to favor him. Still, I thought once we moved into our new home, the issue of who built the house wouldn't come up anymore, so I just kept enduring patiently. However, once our new home was completed and we started living there, their attitude towards me clearly began to change. It seemed like my in-laws, just like Mark, didn't understand the concept of working from home. They thought I was just playing around because I didn't go out during the day and was always at my computer. Mark had been complaining to them about my work schedule, not realizing the hard work and dedication I put into my job. Complaining to them that Emily is just playing around all day, and they seemed to have completely believed it. Before we moved, they never said anything. Maybe because they felt I was taking care of them, but the sarcasm increased as soon as we moved. They say Mark built such a fine house, and you just stay in and play around. Must be nice. Why don't you work a little and help Mark out? Even when I was working on my computer, they would come to my room just to make these snide remarks. The discomfort made me leave the house more and more, working from a cafe instead. I repeatedly appealed to Mark to clear up his parents' misunderstanding. While Mark might not understand the work I do, it's my salary that's supporting his and his parents' lifestyle. All I needed was for him to tell his parents that. But Mark just said, just let them say whatever they want, still not listening. Since I was supposedly not working, I got saddled with all the housework and his parents started bossing me around. I couldn't take it anymore and finally stood up to his parents. Mark was there too, 
and I thought he would finally take my side, seeing how upset I was, but instead he yelled at me, don't talk back. Then, he thrust a completed divorce paper at me, threatening divorce if I didn't comply. I had never seen Mark so angry before, and his behavior completely intimidated me, making me succumb to him and his parents' demands. From that day on, both his parents and Mark's attitudes towards me turned utterly cold. The only time I felt seen and could find some solace was when I was working at my computer. I immersed myself in work to forget the treatment I received from my in-laws and husband. One day, my sister-in-law Susan, who had been living in the city, came back to visit. She was coming to see the new house and planned to stay for a while. My in-laws immediately started complaining about me to her. They said Emily is always cooped up in her room, playing on her computer. Does she even realize whose generosity allows her to live in such a nice house? What on earth is she doing on that computer all day? Playing games? Is she some kind of nerd? That's just weird. We don't really understand all this, but... Maybe she's one of those nerds, you think? If she's always on her computer, she must be one, right? Isn't she ashamed of not working? Trying to escape their loud conversation meant for me to hear. I went to my room. Then I heard something even more shocking. They said, wasn't Emily just cleaner at Mark's company? It's amazing how she lies about working from home. She couldn't possibly have the skills for that. Susan was talking as if my and Mark's roles were completely reversed. Since Mark had told his parents he worked at a major corporation, maybe he was the one who was actually working from home. Maybe he had also lied that I was a cleaner. The real liar here was Mark. I wanted to tell this to Karen and Susan, but given everything that had happened, I doubted they would believe me. So I just gave up. Ever since Susan came to visit, my place at the dining table was taken over by her, and I couldn't even eat at the same time as everyone else. While they ate the meals I prepared during my work breaks, I would be secluded in my room, continuing my work. This went on for a week, and the day for Susan to return to the city came. But suddenly Susan declared, I'm going to live in this house too. After staying here, I found it quite comfortable. I just quit my job, so I've decided to move back here, she said. Susan had been working in the apparel industry, but she got tired of the interpersonal dynamics and decided to take a break. Susan's family home was being rebuilt, so when she returned and, and saw our new house, she found it more luxurious than she had expected. Leaving the city to start a business here could be good. At my level, I can work from anywhere, she said. My in-laws Karen and John were thrilled with Susan's words. Mark seemed quite pleased with the compliments about the house, too. However, there was no designated room for Susan in this house. Until now, she had been staying in the guest room. But if she were to live here, another room for Susan would be needed, and the house had no spare rooms. Susan had realized this after living with us for a week. She told me, I'll live here, so you should leave. Susan said with a smug, malicious grin, people who just play around at home don't deserve to live in a house like this. You should find some cheap apartment somewhere and live there. No, this house is mine because I, that's a good idea. You do nothing but stay at home all day, every day. Karen sided with Susan, leaving me no room to argue. I tried desperately to explain my job, but Susan, who had just said that work could be done from anywhere, wouldn't understand about working from home. Just because I'm not going out, they say I'm not working. They're trying to corner me with such an absurd argument. Uh, after everything that's happened, I'm really starting to get angry. Mark doesn't try to speak the truth just stands there, laughing and watching the situation. Until now I kept quiet, considering Mark's position, but I finally told Karen, John, and Susan that this house was built in my name. I'm paying for all the mortgage and all the living expenses. The down payment came from my savings, and Mark hasn't paid a single penny. Seeing me speak up to this extent, Mark was clearly panicked. However, the only things that came out of his mouth were words to berate me and self-serving statements to hide the truth. He shouted at me, calling me noisy, telling me to shut up. Calling me a liar, Mark was obviously flustered, and it was clear he was hiding something. Yet, Karen, John, and Susan still defended him, calling me a liar. No matter how many times I said it wasn't a lie, they would not believe me. That's when it struck me, 
If I left, who would pay the monthly mortgage of $4,600? There was no reason for me to continue living with these people, enduring such unpleasantness. If this house was supposedly built by Mark, who works at a major corporation, maybe it should truly be his. With that thought, I decided to sign the divorce papers that Mark had pushed on me again, intending to threaten me. When I offered to change the house's title to Mark's name, he was so delighted he almost danced. He must have thought the house would now fully become his own, in name and reality. He's not wrong, but Mark is misunderstanding one thing. Initially, to change the mortgage to his name, we tried to go through the process together, but Mark disliked the complex procedures and told me to handle it alone, reluctant to go. Just go and listen to all that complicated stuff, he said. It's just a name change, right? Get it ready for my signature only. Since that wasn't possible, I took the reluctant Mark to the bank and a legal professional for consultation. Throughout, Mark didn't listen to the explanations and just played with his smartphone. When it came to signing the documents, he finally became eager. If I sign this, the house will be in my name, right? He asked me. After I confirmed, he happily signed the documents. Once all the procedures were completed, both the house and the mortgage would finally be Mark's. I've explained it several times, but I wonder if Mark has truly realized it. He was ecstatically reporting to Karen, Susan, and John. Even after hearing this, how could they still believe that Mark works at a major corporation and I'm unemployed? I watched this scene with a feeling of astonishment. After changing the house and mortgage to his name, I filed for divorce. We're going on a trip to commemorate this, so you better move out or gone, Mark said. While waiting for the procedures to finalize, Mark took Karen, Susan, and John on a ridiculous divorce celebration trip. They were apparently going abroad and wouldn't be back for about 10 days. During that time, I sold all the furniture and appliances I had brought into the house and packed my belongings into the car, ready to leave. While handling various procedures in parallel, I was also looking for a new house and moved immediately after packing my belongings. The place we chose for our fresh start was the top floor of a high-rise condo. It was a stroke of luck that this mansion worth about $5 million was available. However, I thought it must have become available just for me, given the timing, and I decided to boldly purchase it. For the past few years, living with Karen, John, and Mark had been restless, so I was thrilled about my new life ahead. In fact, I had an inheritance left by my deceased parents. I had been investing using that inheritance even before marrying Mark. Initially intended as just a way to earn some pocket money, these investments turned out to be a huge success, and now my assets amount to several million dollars. I had planned to use that money for a relaxed early retirement with Mark in the future. I had kept this asset a secret, intending to surprise Mark, but now I'm truly glad I never mentioned it. If I had told them, Karen, John, and Susan might have joined forces to take my assets. Living with that family, I painfully learned just how careless they are with money. The house I lived in with Mark and his parents was decorated mainly based on their preferences, so it wasn't to my taste. With the move to the condo, I took the opportunity to create a space I love, carefully crafting the interior to my liking. Now it has become the perfect space surrounded only by things I adore. Above all, there's no one around to make snide remarks, so I can happily work from home. Once things settle down, I'm planning to join a cooking class or yoga studio. Finally, in this enjoyable and free time, I have regained a peaceful mind for the first time in years. The call from Mark came the night they returned from their trip abroad. He must have realized that the furniture and appliances were gone upon returning home. He demanded them back, but I paid no attention. Everything was bought with my money, so it's my prerogative to do what I want with it. I didn't want to leave anything of mine in the house of those who had caused me so much suffering, not even the furniture and appliances. Of course they were unnecessary for my new home. When I told Mark that I had already sold them, he still demanded that I buy them back immediately. It's impossible. You, working at a major corporation, should just buy new ones. I retorted and then hung up the phone. That day Mark called several times, but I ignored all of his calls. Months had passed since Mark and his family returned from their overseas trip. I had completely forgotten about my previous life, 
and was having a great time getting along well with my neighbors. That day, I was returning from a cooking class I attended, invited by a friend who lived on the floor below. Suddenly, I received a call from Mark, and although I was suspicious, I answered, thinking there might be an issue with the paperwork that needed attention. I answered the phone and immediately, Mark shouted in a loud voice, What is this all about? It was just like the day they returned from their overseas trip. Wondering if there was anything else besides the furniture and appliances that could have angered my husband, I decided to listen closely. It turns out he had finally noticed the amount of the loan repayments. When he opened the letter that had arrived at the house, he saw that the loan repayment amount was listed as $4,600 per month, which is why he called in a panic. Wasn't the loan already paid off? He exclaimed, of course not. The bank explained everything clearly, didn't they? That's impossible. I never heard about it. And with the fire insurance and your savings, why didn't you pay off the mortgage? No way, that's impossible. Do you even realize how much that house was worth? Shockingly, it seems Mark believed the mortgage was already paid off. Despite the bank's detailed explanation, which Mark had nodded to, he was apparently under a different impression. I was sitting right next to him, watching and listening, so I remember it well. Even if Mark wasn't paying attention, he had already signed the mortgage transfer, so it's too late now. Mark kept trying to find a way out of the mortgage payments, but there was nothing I could do about it. Eventually, he seemed to realize that he had no choice but to repay the loan and fell silent, seemingly frustrated. I thought you'd be struggling to find a place to live, Mark said, clearly under the impression that I was in a dire situation. The reason Mark could freely spend his salary until now was because I was the one covering our living expenses. Even after our divorce, I have no trouble living on my own. It's too late for him to realize that he was relying on me for everything. I wonder what kind of life my pretentious ex-husband Mark has been leading these past few months with his parents Karen and John. Most likely they were living luxuriously, doing whatever Susan suggested. And then he realized there was a mortgage to be paid. I wonder what Mark is going to do now, I thought, as if it were someone else's problem. Since we're practically strangers now, I couldn't care less about how much trouble my ex-husband and his parents, Karen and John, are in. Seeing my husband so frustrated, I decided to tell him the truth. Too bad. I moved into a luxury condo with the money I made from a successful investment. Then while he was speechless, I hung up the phone. There were no calls from him after that. So I thought he had managed somehow, but then, out of the blue, he called again. When I answered, wondering what it was about this time, it turns out their house had been seized, and he was in a panic. In the background, I could hear the voices of his parents, Karen and John, and his sister Susan, all sounding pretty desperate. What should I do? Help me, Emily. My husband, whom I had kicked out, desperately pleaded. A person claiming to be an enforcement officer was visiting the house and I could hear the voices of his parents, Karen and John, and his sister Susan in the background, also addressing the officer. According to this officer, the house was about to be put up for auction, with details like the auction date and bidding period to be decided. Once the auctioneer was determined and ownership transferred, my husband and his family would be evicted from the house. I thought they must have received warning letters leading up to this, but when I asked my husband, he sounded confused and said they hadn't arrived. However, that couldn't be right, and after persistent questioning, he finally admitted in a small voice, maybe they did arrive. It turned out he had intentionally ignored the letters, realizing they were about loan repayments. The envelopes were already open before I saw them. I thought someone was taking care of the payments. Probably Karen, John, and Susan thought the same as my husband. Eventually, a demand for the lump sum repayment of the loan arrived, and it seems my husband and his family were aware of the loan, but continued to ignore it, thinking someone else would pay it. And so the house was finally seized. Can't you do something now like pay it off? You could pull everyone's savings. There's got to be a way. I said, unable to hide my frustration at my husband's helpless tone. But all he could say in response to my suggestion was, it's impossible. Apparently, Karen and John had squandered their savings on an extravagant overseas trip and were planning to rely on their son, 
who works in a big company, for their future. It was all just their assumption. And Susan, his sister, who claimed she had quit her job to come back home, was actually fired for embezzling company funds. She talks as if she's been hugely successful in the city, but in reality she was just a modestly paid accountant in a small to mid-sized company. Yet she got hooked on visiting nightclubs, gradually embezzling money from her company to splurge on them. Even though she actually returned home relying on her parents, Karen and John, she had the nerve to make such grand claims. As for my ex-husband, after our divorce, he pretended to be working at a large corporation and started dipping into his savings to cover living expenses. Both Karen, John, and Susan lived lavishly, and the money he had saved while we were married was completely gone. Then came the demand for the lump sum repayment of the loan. As our previously hidden financial situations came to light, it seemed like the focus was shifting from the court case to each other. In the midst of this, my ex-husband started clinging to me. Please, Emily, you're living in that high-rise luxury condo now. Right? Let's all live together there again. I refuse. We're divorced now, and as far as I'm concerned, we're strangers. Although I felt a bit sorry for him earlier, I definitely don't want to live with those people ever again. Hearing the voices of my ex-in-laws, Karen, John, and Susan from the background, I felt more resolved. And so I firmly declined my ex-husband's offer. Upon hearing my refusal, Karen, John, and Susan immediately started hurling insults at me. I heard various derogatory terms like heartless, scammer, and thief. Perhaps out of spite for being rejected, my ex-husband joined Karen, John, and Susan in berating me. The noise over the phone was unbearable. Despite everything being the result of their own actions, there was no sign of remorse from them. Eventually, all four of them started a blame game leaving me out of it and beginning to argue among themselves. I decided then and there to never involve myself with these people again, quietly hung up the phone and blocked my ex-husband's number. A few days later I came across a concerning headline in a corner of the newspaper. The article was about a father and son getting into a fist fight and the police being called out, which made me suspect it was about my ex-husband and his father. I decided to contact a mutual acquaintance of ours who lives near my ex-in-law's home. Sure enough, the incident reported in the newspaper was about them. And it happened after I had hung up the phone on my ex-husband. The article mentioned that a neighbor noticed the fight and called the police, leading to their arrest. My ex-husband, his father, along with Karen and Susan who tried to intervene, all sustained injuries that would take about two weeks to heal completely. After receiving a stern warning from the police, they were released. But the incident making the headlines meant my ex-husband, although not fired, faced severe reprimands at his workplace. The cause of the parent-child fight was embellished and quickly spread throughout the company. My ex-husband feels uncomfortable at work but can't afford to quit due to financial necessities. Eventually, a buyer was found for the house and they were forced to move out. Somehow they managed to find a new place, but it's an old, cramped, bug-infested apartment, a far cry from their previous home where the family of four began their new life. Bugs appearing daily in the room are causing Susan and Karen to make such a fuss that they have already received complaints from the neighbors. They tried to find new jobs and rent a new house quickly, but both in-laws and Susan seem to get into trouble at work and end up being fired. Especially Susan, with her past of embezzling company funds becoming widely known, is finding it difficult to get rehired. It looks like they will have to continue living on my ex-husband's income alone. My ex-husband seems to be trying to find out where I live, asking our mutual acquaintances persistently, who have warned me to be cautious. I was warned to be careful, even if my ex-husband finds my condo. He will just be turned away by the full-time concierge. I gratefully accepted the advice from my acquaintance and made sure to ask the concierge to be on the lookout. With this, the turmoil with my ex-husband and his family finally comes to an end. It hasn't even been a year since I left that house, but it already feels like a distant past event. I have completely adapted to life in my luxury condo, enjoying my days filled with hobbies and work. I plan to enjoy my carefree single life for a while without thinking about marriage. My name is Amy Miller. I am a 32-year-old 
who has been married for seven years. My husband is a kind and hardworking man, and we have had a trouble-free life together. I only took maternity leave and have continued working ever since. We are what you would call a dual-income family. Even before we had a child, my husband Owen was involved in parenting, and after becoming a dad, he helped even more with daycare drop-offs and household chores. I always thought I was more blessed than most wives out there. Then our child turned six and was about to start elementary school. I began to notice something wrong with my husband's health. Why don't you go to the doctor? I asked, but he didn't go because he was too busy with work. By the time he was willing to go, he was diagnosed with end-stage renal failure and needed a kidney transplant. His strength declined gradually, and as he became unable to work, he was forced to retire and he couldn't even take care of our child properly anymore. As a result, everything fell on my shoulders, and I was overwhelmed with the busyness of work, house chores, child care, and taking care of my husband. My husband would whisper I'm sorry in a weak voice, which was heartbreaking, and I pushed myself even harder. But no matter how hard I tried, the mind and body are separate, and my body started to scream in pain. That's when my mother-in-law brought up the idea of living together. It's too much for you to handle alone, isn't it? She asked. Indeed, I felt I was nearing my limit. My mother-in-law lost my father-in-law soon after we got married and has been living alone ever since. She must feel lonely, but she never complains, and whenever I visit her, she greets me with joy. I can't even begin to express my gratitude to my mother-in-law, who gets along with me so well, it's like we're friends. Tears flowed from the sheer difficulty of it all when she offered to move in. Living with my mother-in-law turned out to be a blessing beyond what I had imagined. While I was out working during the day, she would take care of the housework and the kids. My first grader daughter didn't, didn't feel lonely, thanks to her. Snacks were always homemade, and my mother-in-law would help her with her homework. She helped with my homework, and also took care of my husband, encouraging him to do what he could on his own. However, she often had to step in because he easily grew tired. When I got home, I would take over. But since I could do things faster than my husband, I often let him rest. Maybe that was my mistake, because gradually he stopped doing anything at all. I'm just feeling really sluggish. Unaware that it was just an excuse from my husband, I accepted it all, thinking he was ill. But it seemed like he believed that if he said so, he wouldn't have to do anything. As he did less and less, he began to look for distractions outside the home. While searching for a donor, my husband started going for dialysis three times a week. At first, during his three weekly hospital visits, he apparently went to the arcade and roamed around various places. He seemed apologetic each time, but he must have believed that my words, that's great. You have enough energy to go to the arcade, meant that I was okay with him playing around. This way, he increasingly turned his attention outward, and before I knew it, he left everything to my mother-in-law and did as he pleased when he felt well. I can't blame him, he's sick after all. I kept telling myself, no matter how tough it got, even when I was too exhausted to move, I can still do this. Then one day, we got the call from the hospital that they had found a donor, and it turned out that the donor was me. Please, Amy, give me your kidney. Upon learning that I could be a donor, my husband begged me on his knees. I was delighted at the thought of my beloved husband getting better. But if I stopped working, our family would quickly be in dire straits. There were risks involved with the kidney removal surgery, as I was told by the doctors. Was it really okay for me to be the donor? But if it makes him well again, I'm his wife after all. With that excuse, I went through with the surgery. My husband cried with joy, thinking he'd get better. No more dialysis after this. Once the surgery's over, I'll be back to my old self. Not a single word of thanks was there for me. The surgery was a success. After a few days in the hospital, I went back to work. However, I had naively underestimated the risks the doctor had mentioned. I thought it couldn't happen to me. But even before my husband was discharged, a growing fatigue began to assault my body. What's this? I couldn't afford to be anxious. Eh, why is so much of my hair falling out? Every morning clumps of hair would come out as I brushed. Fear began to consume me. By the time my husband was discharged, my fear had turned into something much greater. 
but I had no time to think about myself. You should help out with the housework. As part of your rehabilitation, my mother-in-law would always say, help out with the housework. But Owen was always out playing, as if carried by the wind. Instead of helping, he would look at me and say, What's that on your head? It's disgusting mocking my thinning hair. And then one day he threw his last words at me, I'm divorcing you, you sick bald woman. I'm starting a new life. I was stunned by his words. What do you mean? I asked, still in my work clothes. What about your mother? I continued, I have to tell her about such important matters. What are you talking about? Owen replied, this is a matter between husband and wife. It's got nothing to do with mom. But I couldn't help but think of how much my mother-in-law had helped us. You might have been saved, but I don't care. Anyway, I'm divorcing you. I was taken aback by his sudden decision. Why? Why all of a sudden? My head was spinning, and I desperately needed my mother-in-law's calm analysis. But when I got home, she had gone out shopping. That's right, she had said, I'm going out for dinner shopping. In that moment, I felt like I had no one on my side. All the efforts I had made to save our marriage came crashing down. I have to solve this myself, I thought. I can't accept such an unreasonable proposal. It's not right for Violet if we get a divorce. I thought of our elementary school-aged daughter, but it seemed like my husband wasn't thinking about her at all. Look, I've gotten healthy, but look at you, that monstrous head of yours. It's unbearable to look at, but I couldn't believe what he was saying. But this happened because I gave you a kidney, I reminded him. So what? He replied callously. Don't act like you're doing me a favor. Sure, I asked for a kidney. But if I had known you would go bald, I would never have asked. I was hurt by his words. How can you say that? I didn't choose to go bald. After all the pain I went through to help you. You've been thinking this the whole time since you got out of the hospital? I asked, tears welling up in my eyes. Yeah, I have, he admitted. It's been torture seeing you every day. To think of waking up next to a monster for the rest of my life. It's just disgusting. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. That's cruel, I said, my voice shaking. After I gave you my kidney, you're gonna say that? Sure, I asked for it. But who would have thought it would turn you into a monster? He retorted. But still, just sign the divorce papers, all right? Here, sign this. He carelessly tossed a set of divorce papers at me. Sign, he demanded. I couldn't believe it. The papers were already signed and stamped with his name. Once you sign this, we're strangers, he said coldly. That'll be a relief, won't it? I couldn't believe how heartless he was being. But what about Violet? I asked, my heart breaking for our daughter. She's still in elementary school. Wouldn't she be sad if her parents got divorced? She'll forget about it soon enough, he replied callously. It's no big deal. What do you mean by that? I mean, once I'm divorced from you, I can find a new love. Then I can remarry a beautiful woman. Are you saying you've been cheating? Why would you think that? You think I'd have time to cheat while I was sick? Sure, normally, one wouldn't have the time to cheat. But looking back, it seemed he spent too much time away from the family. But, but nothing. Don't accuse me of things that aren't true. You're a monster who's jealous for no reason. How much more disgusting can you get? Just sign the divorce papers already. Wait, you can't just spring this on me. It's not sudden. Since I got sick, I've really thought about it. It's a waste of time to stay with an old wife like you. I've always hated how you made me feel indebted. I decided in my heart that I'd divorce you once I got well. Once you got well? Is that why you asked me for a kidney? I didn't necessarily need your kidney. Any would have done, but... But it just so happened that yours was available. It's only sensible to use what's usable. With such a cavalier attitude, I've taken on so many risks because of this. Weren't you informed about the risks at the hospital? You decided to go through with it anyway, didn't you? I didn't force you. Yeah, but if I'm gone, who's gonna work and take care of this house? Don't worry, you don't need to think about that. I'm healthy now. I can work and provide for the family. Even when you keep saying every day how sluggish and feverish you feel, you're gonna work like that? Yeah, I'll be fine. I'm sure I'll be back to my full strength soon. Then I can find a job again and start supporting the family. So you're that healthy now.
But you haven't done anything yourself. You let mom and me do everything. That's because you wanted to do it all, yet you always said you could do it faster yourself. It's true, but it was Owen who was content to let it be that way. So once you sign that, you can get out? Get out, why? Obviously, once you sign it, you're a stranger to me. It'd be weird for a stranger to live in my family home. It's only natural that you're a stranger to me. But what about Violet? You can't just tell me to leave all of a sudden. I have nowhere to go. What are you talking about? It's obvious Violet stays here. I can't leave my child with a woman who doesn't even have a place to live. So it was all planned out. Owen had me donate a kidney just so he could kick me out once he started feeling better. I was just conveniently used. I was completely dejected and unable to think. My mother-in-law walked into the room and home. Oh, what's wrong? Looking for rescue in the face of my returned mother-in-law, I saw a young woman standing next to her. Hey, why are you in the house? I told you to wait outside. Well, I couldn't help it. Your mom told me to come in. You have to listen to your future mother-in-law, right? Eh, future mother-in-law? Idiot. Don't say weird things. Mom, why did you even let her in the house? Well, when I came back from shopping, this girl was standing outside. When I asked what she wanted, she said she knew you. So naturally, I told her to come in. What's wrong with that? Isn't that what you'd expect? Indeed, that's expected. If someone is said to be acquainted with my husband, they would be let in. But this woman who's said to be an acquaintance? What kind of acquaintance is she? Weren't you just an acquaintance? That is, well, more than an acquaintance, I'm his girlfriend. And soon I'll be family to your mother-in-law. Eh? What is this girl talking about? That is, come on Owen, say it clearly. That I'm your girlfriend, and we're promised to marry. You've been cheating. But you just said you didn't have time for that. <sighs> that is, that's why. Why did you come into the house just because you were invited? Well, I wanted to see the bald-headed monster for myself. Owen said his wife's head has become so bald, she looks like a monster or a goblin. It's disgusting to think of being with that for the rest of his life. How could you say such a thing? No, Mom, it's not like that. So since you're getting divorced and she's leaving this house, I won't get to see such a monster again. I was curious to see how much of a monster she is. And then what a pity, she's wearing a wig. So my husband and his mistress have been laughing at me? And that's why you want to divorce Amy? That's a divorce paper there, isn't it? No, that's... That is... Amy, do you agree with this? Mom, I was just suddenly told about it. So I'm in a panic right now. I don't understand what's happening. After all the devoted care she's given you while you were sick. What have you been doing? And he's telling me after we get divorced I have to leave this house. But I have nowhere to go. I can't give up Violet. Of course. Why would I let a child go to such a terrible man who can do things like this? But mom, if you give Amy the child, I won't be able to see Violet. I won't be able to see Violet anymore. I'm saying I'll take Violet for your sake. My mother-in-law was silent for a while, but when she spoke, it was something unexpected. Amy, please sign the divorce papers. Eh, I thought, so I'm just the daughter-in-law after all. But then my mother-in-law said something completely different. If you sign the divorce papers, it's you who will be leaving. Why should I leave? Whose house is this? That's mom's, so that means I get to decide who lives in this house, doesn't it? I want to live with Amy. I don't want to live with a young woman who goes after someone else's husband. And what's with this old lady? And about Violet. There's no way a woman who spews such nastiness can take care of a child. Besides, you're unemployed. An unemployed person with no fixed address can't raise a child. So it should be Amy who takes custody of the child. That's absurd, Mom. What's the problem? You've been using your illness as an excuse not to do anything around the house. You hardly even look after Violet. Moreover, since you've been discharged, you've just been selfishly yelling around. Can't you see that Violet is scared of you? Why? Parents get angry sometimes, don't they? You're just shouting for no reason. Of course, the child is frightened. That's not what being a parent is about. You're the one who has to leave. Mom, you're not on my side? I'm on the side of what's right. You're wrong. You betrayed a dedicated wife like Amy. How could I possibly be on your side? Damn it. 
Bye, men. Owen grabbed the signed divorce papers and left with the woman. After they left, my mother-in-law kneeled down and apologized to me. I'm so sorry, I never knew he would do such a stupid thing. He didn't understand at all how much she struggled to take care of him. I can't ask for forgiveness, but please. You've done nothing wrong. Please lift your face. I'm sorry, it's my fault for raising him wrong. That's not true. My kind mother-in-law apologized again and again, blaming her upbringing. How could the child of such a kind person turn out like this? Every time I remembered my former husband, I just couldn't understand where things went wrong. Three months later, as usual, living with my mother-in-law and Violet, I received a call from my ex-husband Owen. But I couldn't bring myself to answer the phone and just ignored it, yet Owen left a message. Thinking I might as well listen to it, I played the message, and it was as selfish as ever. Why aren't you picking up the phone? I'm in a serious situation here. Turns out I have liver disease now. I need another transplant. Your liver would be perfect for me. So give me your liver. Then I can be healthy again. Please pick up the phone. My ex-husband sounded almost hysterical. I thought to myself how utterly selfish he was. When I told my mother-in-law, she looked pained. What do you think, Amy? I'm sorry to say this, but Owen is a stranger to me now. After everything he's said and done, I can't bring myself to give anything to him. Of course. You're not wrong. That must be divine punishment. I'm sorry. Don't apologize. I'm sure if you gave your liver, he wouldn't be grateful. Besides, if you were to get sick from the donation, it would be terrible for Violet. You're making the right decision. It's okay, that's the way it should be. If he contacts you again, just tell him straight. Thank you. And if God forgives, surely a donor will be found. If not, that's the punishment he's been given. It can't be helped. My mother-in-law said this with sad eyes. It was a hard choice for her, thinking of her son. Yet the pain of not being able to do that must be immeasurable. But she knew that even if I did donate, Owen's character wouldn't change. Continuing to be selfish and hurting me and my family, I found myself wishing he would just suffer alone. Then there was another contact from my husband. The number of calls was devilishly high, and the voicemails were full of bitterness because I wasn't answering. Out of frustration for not answering the calls, Owen came to our house. As before, when I returned from work, my mother-in-law had gone shopping, and I was alone in the house. I felt a slight fear of Owen's actions, as if he was intentionally waiting for my mother-in-law to be out. Hey, Amy. Owen, who greeted me with those words, looked gaunt and his complexion was poor. It seemed like his illness had advanced significantly. Why aren't you answering your phone? Why wouldn't I want to talk to you? But I left you a message, I heard it. Then why didn't you respond? I didn't see the need to. I'm begging you, why won't you help me? It didn't seem like begging, and even if it was, I have no intention of being your donor. Why not? I don't have much time left. My condolences. I'm still alive. That's unfortunate. Please, give me your liver. No, thank you. Why don't you understand? Think about what you did to me after I gave you my kidney. That couldn't be helped. I don't think it was unavoidable at all. No matter how much you beg, I won't become your donor. If I did and something happened to me, you would just play ignorant, wouldn't you? If you need a liver that badly, ask her. Nora left me when she found out I was sick. She dumped me and left. Well, that's tough. But it's what you deserve. Don't say that. Being divorced means I'm alone. You have no idea how hard it is to endure feeling sluggish every day and still have to work. I understand. I gave you a kidney, remember? I still feel sluggish from that. Yet I do the housework, take care of the child and work. I think I have it harder than you. Then I'll remarry you. I'll overlook your baldness. Marry me, give me your liver, and I'll work this time. That way you can take it easy, right? Time out. I'm not relying on you. And marry me as if it's a favor from you. How can you even say that when you're in trouble? I won't give you my liver. Don't come back. Don't be like that. If you keep this up, I'll call the police. Got it? Hearing the word police, Owen fled like he was running away. I thought that would be the last of it, but Owen had more outrageous plans. That happened a few days later. 
My mother-in-law contacted me to say that Violet hadn't returned from school. Violet hasn't come back? Yes, she's usually back by this time, but she's nowhere to be found. I've looked everywhere. For a moment, Owen's face flashed through my mind, but surely he wouldn't take his own child. I dismissed the thought, but then Owen called. If you want Violet back, give me your liver. What? Owen? Yes, that's right. You must be worried about Violet, right? Give me your liver, and I'll bring her back. Violet must be the most important thing to you. How could you kidnap a child? I've only taken my own child. This isn't kidnapping. Unfortunately for you, we're divorced, and I have custody. A stranger taking a child is definitely kidnapping. I'm calling the police. You're prepared for that, right? Why does it end up like this? I just want your liver. I never thought of kidnapping. It's too late. If you had given me your liver, I wouldn't have had to do this. It's your fault, isn't it? Don't blame others for everything. You cheated and abandoned your family. And when you got sick, you expected help. And when things didn't go your way, you kidnapped your child. That's unforgivable. Why are you getting so angry? It's your fault. Enough. I hung up the phone and immediately contacted the police to report that my child was kidnapped. The police quickly deployed to Owen's apartment and rescued my child. Violet came back to me with tears streaming down her face, clinging to me and crying. Afterwards, Owen, who was arrested, reached out through his lawyer asking for forgiveness. It seemed he truly regretted it. What should I do? That's up to you, Amy. I'm his mother, I'd be happy if he's forgiven, but I also understand if you don't want to forgive. I can't tell you what to do. You're right. If I prioritized my feelings, I couldn't possibly forgive him. Since that incident, Violet has been afraid to go out alone. Considering he's her father, it's terrible to think what must have happened to make her so afraid. But Violet doesn't say anything when asked. Still, when I think of my mother-in-law after carrying this maze-like worry for months, I ultimately decided to settle. Owen, having been released from detention, bowed deeply, apologizing, and then he started asking to remarry. I said selfish things about remarrying. I regret it, but in the police cell I realized what I really need is Amy. Amy needs me too, right? Without me it just won't do, so if we remarry, I'm the best choice, right? Then you can take care of me again. I have no intention of remarrying. Why not? I care so much about you. While asking to remarry, his words betrayed that it wasn't really about remarriage. He's scheming to use me under the guise of remarrying. Stop it. I'll never marry you again. Since he brought up the issue of being a donor again, after discussing with my mother-in-law, I decided to move with my daughter. Learning of my move, my ex-husband became frantic, searching for me, but ultimately he succumbed to his illness, passing away in fear. As for me, even though I left the in-law's house, I keep in touch with my mother-in-law, and she even comes over to stay sometimes. I'm planning to buy a house where I can live with my mother-in-law once I've saved enough money. My name is Eleanor Smith. I've been married for five years. At 30, I'm still childless and feeling increasingly anxious about it. But my husband says kids are just a hassle and expensive. We don't need them. Let's buy a house instead. He talks about it as casually as if he's suggesting getting a pet. No secondhand homes for me. It's gotta be. It's gotta be a new build. And once it's built, my mom's gonna move in with us. That's settled. I don't quite understand his decision-making process. But my husband is absolutely obsessed with owning our own home. My husband George is an only child, so I anticipated living with my mother-in-law eventually. I don't particularly dislike her, and I thought there wouldn't be any issues. Therefore, I agreed to move forward with buying a house. We carefully planned the layout to ensure a peaceful family life, even paying attention to things like the direction the house faces. The home we built is something I'm satisfied with. And so my mother-in-law moved in, marking the start of our new family setup. However, problems started to emerge as soon as we began living together. My mother-in-law's personality, which I hadn't noticed in our infrequent meetings, became glaringly obvious. She wouldn't return my morning greetings, recleaned areas I had already tidied up, and criticized the way I cut vegetables in the kitchen. If I did it her way, the next time she'd insist on something entirely different. 
Maybe she's just trying to teach me. But then again, maybe she forgets what she said due to her age. I tried to think that way. However, as time passed, I started to wonder if bothering her daughter-in-law was her hobby. She always had something to complain about no matter how trivial. She constantly nitpicked everything I did. Whenever I tried to take a shower, she would try to do so at the same time. Or she would decide to leave the house at the same time I planned to. She even said that staying home was my duty as a daughter-in-law, so I was forced to change my plans. I eventually spoke to George about these issues, but he wouldn't listen, and even yelled at me for speaking ill of his mother. Half a year passed, and both George and his mother stopped speaking to me altogether. It's like I don't exist, with no conversation or interaction. My mother-in-law talks cheerfully with my husband, but the moment I enter the room, they both fall silent. When I sit at the table for meals, she lets out a big sigh. The vibe's off, isn't it? Speaking of which, since Eleanor's not here, I gotta say, she's really incompetent. George, why did you marry such a woman? Living with her is driving me nuts. Something happened? The lights in the bathroom are always left on, the water's running all the time, and clothes are strewn everywhere. How was she even raised? That's terrible. I'll talk to her next time. It's no use. She'll just deny it and make things unpleasant. The truth is, I haven't done any of that. In fact, it's all my mother-in-law's fault. All my mother-in-law's doing. She blames everything on me, and my husband believes it all. As a result, we've been getting along poorly lately, even sleeping in separate rooms. The reason given was that there are plenty of rooms in the house. Sure, we have spare rooms for future kids, but I never thought it would lead to marital separation. This meal is awful. Maybe Eleanor's cooking doesn't suit your taste, Mom. She might be taste deaf. If I have to eat this lousy food, I'd rather eat out. Yeah, let's get some yummy seafood. And so my cooking remains uneaten, and I eat alone every day. In the vast room, only the TV seems to talk to me. What a pitiful life. Why am I being ignored? What did I do wrong? I just don't get it. There's a limit to how much one can be ignored. Recently, the stress has gotten so bad that I've developed alopecia areata. It was supposed to be a happy marriage, but here I am, stressed, to the point of losing my hair. Who could have imagined this? One day when I returned from work and tried to unlock the front door, it wouldn't open. I could insert the key, but it wouldn't turn. Strange, why is that? I, I tried several times, but it just wouldn't budge. Then I heard laughter from the other side of the door. Are you there? I called out. The key won't turn. Can you please open the door? I expected to be ignored, but I couldn't start dinner without getting inside. And I knew I'd get snide comments if I didn't cook, even though no one would eat it. Please open the door, I pleaded, but contrary to my expectations, I heard her voice. You're not needed here anymore, she said. What do you mean by that? I asked, bewildered. It's simple. This is no longer your home. So please go somewhere else. After that, I heard nothing more from my mother-in-law. What's going on? I muttered bewildered as I returned to my car. I tried calling my husband, but he didn't pick up. No matter how many times I called, there was no answer, leading me to suspect that he and his mother were in cahoots. Knowing those two, it must be true. They're really going to this extent to drive me away, which is just too much. If they wanted me out, they should have discussed divorce, but there was no talk of that. No choice. I guess I'll stay at a motel for the night. I resigned and drove to the motel. Lying in bed, I felt even more confused. I hadn't done anything to deserve this treatment. In fact, I had been the one putting in all the effort to make our marriage work. I had been the one putting up with things. I tried contacting my mother-in-law again and also my husband, but to no avail. I tried calling at different times, even when I thought my husband would be home, but he still didn't answer. What's happening? Do they want to break up? If so, they need to tell me because I can't understand without any communication. Days turned into a week, and I still couldn't reach either of them. This is costing me a fortune in motel fees. I don't want to worry my mom, but I have no choice but to go back home. So I decided to return to my parents' home for the time being. But that house is mine too. If this continues, I'll keep paying the mortgage without living there. 
This is ridiculous. After much thought, I decided it was pointless to keep paying the mortgage and resolved to sell the house. I contacted a friend who was a realtor, and they said they could quickly sell it. Well, it's bound to be lower than the purchase price, considering it's been three years. I reasoned with myself, preparing to hand it over to the realtor. It's not fair to sell the house without telling George and his mother. If they were suddenly told to vacate, they'd be in trouble too. Even though they had done the same to me, I couldn't bring myself to do it when I thought about their predicament. I'll just text them on Messenger, and if they don't read it, then I'll go through with it. I can't keep taking care of everything forever. So, messaged my husband and his mother about my decision to sell the house, expecting to be ignored. But surprisingly, right after sending the message, I got a reply from my mother-in-law. What the heck is this? Ah, uh, hi, it's been a while. How dare you say such a cliché? Well, I couldn't think of any other way. What's this all about? Why are you selling the house? It doesn't make sense to keep paying the mortgage when I'm not living there. You're supposed to pay it, aren't you? Why should I? Because you built that house. True, but then I guess it's my decision to sell it, right? That's ridiculous. We're living here. That's why I'm telling you about it now. I wouldn't want you to be suddenly forced to leave. Of course, we'd have nowhere to go if you just kicked us out. I was in the same situation, you know. What are you talking about? About the time you changed the locks. And I couldn't enter my own house. That was necessary. We really don't need you around. What an attitude. Even after doing such terrible things, she doesn't feel any guilt. Anyway, there's no need for me to keep paying the mortgage anymore. I won't be paying the mortgage anymore. I'll be selling the house soon, so please prepare to move out. I won't allow that. Even after that, a flood of messages from my mother-in-law kept coming and pressing me hard. But I didn't respond to any of them, completely ignoring her messages. I've said what I needed to say, and whether they move out or not is their own decision. However, that night my husband called. It seemed he thought I stopped replying because it was a text conversation. Hey, you must have heard from your mother. Besides, am I being kicked out of the house because you want a divorce? We're not talking about that right now. Don't change the subject. I won't allow you to sell the house. But this is my house. But the house is in my name, isn't it? What's that supposed to mean? Don't you remember when we were building the house and we discussed whose name it would be in? You said you'd handle the living expenses, so the mortgage should be in my name. Oh, right. That's true. But what does that have to do with the ownership? Didn't you say it would be too much hassle to arrange the paperwork in your name? And when I said if the house was in your name, you'd have to pay the taxes. You didn't want that. So you insisted it be in my name, remember? Uh, yeah, I guess I did say that. But even if it's in your name, I'm living here. And we built this house together. But I, the owner, am not there. It's, it's absurd to keep paying the mortgage after being kicked out. That's why I've decided to sell it. There's nothing odd about it. It's a house built for the family. Then are you going to take over the mortgage payments? If so, that's fine by me. Back then, my husband left everything to me. The house's title, the taxes, the paperwork, and the mortgage. Everything was made to come to me. Now that I can't enter the house, it's unnecessary for me. Don't be ridiculous. I'll never allow you to sell the house. Then let's have a proper discussion. If we continue living separately, it needs to be decided whether we get a divorce or not. My belongings are still there, after all. Above all, I don't like this uncertainty. All right, that makes sense. Come over tomorrow, then. So I stepped into that house again, but I was faced with a shocking truth. Let's settle the divorce issue first. My husband said presenting me with a blank divorce form. He probably searched for the website and downloaded it. He really intended to divorce. Staring at the divorce paper, I couldn't decide. I, I couldn't decide whether to sign it or not. Should I make it this easy to end the marriage? I had anticipated something like this, yet I hesitated. What's the matter? Hurry up and sign it. I can't be married to a woman who does things her own way. I disliked what you said yesterday. And that made me want to divorce for sure. So it's all my fault, is it? What are you hesitating for? 
Take it quickly. Yes, hurry up and proceed with it. We don't need a selfish woman like you. That's when it happened. The front door opened and a woman's voice said, I'm home. Moreover, she entered the living room carrying bags filled with vegetables and meat. Oh, do we have a guest? Sorry, I didn't notice, she said, noticing the divorce paper on the table and smiling unpleasantly. Ah, the ex-wife. Finally, ready to agree to the divorce, right? Excuse me? You not divorcing George meant I couldn't marry him. Right, George? Wait, what does this mean? George always told me you wouldn't agree to the divorce. Of course, that makes sense. At your age, remarriage must be difficult. Clinging to the role of a wife, I get it. What are you talking about? What do you mean, what? You know, George and I have been together for three years, right? What? Three years? Around the time this house was built? Since then, George has been asking you for a divorce, but you just wouldn't agree, making it hard for me to marry him. Clinging to this house just because you want it. How greedy can you be? Listening to her, things started to make sense to me. So, you started being harsh to me right after we moved in with your mother because you wanted to remarry with this person you had a girlfriend. What? You didn't know? What do you mean, George? What is she talking about? Oh, she's just confused. Probably doesn't remember what we talked about. Ah, I see. That's why George was so tired of her. Yeah, that's right. Isn't it, Mom? That's right. George never liked you. So you all have been deceiving me. No, it's not like we've been deceiving you. It shouldn't matter if she came into the house. You left on your own. Left on my own? You're the one who changed the locks and made sure I couldn't get in. But you still chose to leave. I see. I understand now. I took the divorce paper and put it in my bag. Then I'll be selling this house. That's ridiculous. This is my house. The divorce has been decided. Since the house is in my name, it's my right to sell it or do whatever I please. No way. Then transfer the title to me. There's something called division of property in a divorce, right? Just give me the house and we can end this. Do you really think you can afford the mortgage on this house? What are you talking about? If you can pay, why can't I? Don't say something stupid. Really? Are you sure about this? Yeah, I don't care. Anyway, if the house stayed in your name, you'd do something bad with it. You're that kind of woman. All right, then. I'll give you the house in the property division, and I'll take the house savings. In exchange, I'll leave the furniture and household items. Well, okay. My husband had no idea how much the mortgage was. He never bothered to check. He didn't care about how much I had been paying each month. And now, with this other woman in the picture, once this house is gone, he'll likely never own a house again. My husband must have thought he could win over the woman with the house's bait. Once the house is gone, it's clear she will look down on him. That's why, even if he has to give up his savings, he wants to keep the house. What a foolish man. The lowest of the low, he deserves to go to hell. A month later, I received a call from George. To my amazement, he was frantic about the mortgage not being paid. Hey, what's going on? The mortgage isn't paid. What? That's none of my business now. The house is yours. What are you talking about? The title might be mine now, but the mortgage is yours. What? Why would that be? I just asked for the title. I never said I'd pay the mortgage. That's why I asked if you could afford the mortgage. You said it would be easy, remember? What? Is that what you meant? What else could it mean? I asked if you were sure, but now there's nothing you can do. The mortgage. I have to pay it? Why did you think I would be paying after that conversation? How selfish can you be? Uh, how much is the mortgage each month? It's $2,000 a month. $2,000? Half of my $4,000 salary is going to the mortgage. Exactly. How can I live like this? My allowance, her allowance. Do you give her an allowance? Of course. I never got an allowance from you. But you were working. Then she should work too, right? No, she can't. She's a natural-born lazy bones. I can't ask her to work. Ridiculous. Then you have to figure it out. I'm divorced from you now, so it's not my problem. Don't say that. I'm curious. Where did you two meet? How do you even have a connection if she's jobless? We met on a dating site. You were on a dating site? Yeah, well, so you met there and had an affair, Matt? Well, yes. 
This is not funny. We're divorced now, so it doesn't matter. I can't believe you wanted to marry someone like her. The same goes for her. When we were married, things were fine, so I thought it would work out. I was working, remember? Well, do as you like. I don't care anymore. Six months passed without any contact from George. I thought he and his wife must have managed to get by. However, what George said next was completely unexpected. It's no good. What now? Actually, I was planning to use mom's savings to pay the mortgage. But she doesn't have any savings. Oh, your mother, she's quite the social butterfly. Exactly. She said in the past three years she's been traveling, going to bars, and eating at fancy restaurants. She doesn't have any savings left. I see. When I asked her what she planned to do, she said she thought it would be okay because I was there. I see. When I asked about her pension, it turned out to be just a tiny amount. Maybe you should get your new wife to work? Yeah. I realized this situation was bad, so I asked her to work. Then she said, it's terrible to ask her to work since she's never had a job before. She said she married me because I promised she wouldn't have to work and that I'd support her as a housewife. But she doesn't even do any housework. Well, she's a cute wife, isn't that enough? She's always fighting with mom every day. Your new wife fights with your mother? Yeah, in the end, mom loses and does all the household work. Wow, she even defeated her mother-in-law. That's some strength. Too strong. This is unsustainable. Well, that's what you chose. Don't say that. Please lend me some money. What? You're asking me a stranger to lend you money? You must be joking. We're strangers, why would I lend you anything? You should have your own personal savings. Well, I spent a lot to win her over, and now my savings are gone. How foolish can you be? I thought you would keep paying the mortgage, so I believed everything would be fine. And yet, why did you cheat and get a divorce? Your actions are completely nonsensical. Nonsensical. I thought you would continue to make payments, even after the divorce. I believed you wouldn't abandon me because you're kind. That's just wishful thinking. Who, after being dumped, would still support their ex? That's just not realistic. You won't lend me any money? Of course not. No one lends money to someone with no prospects of paying it back. Fine. Then I'll borrow from a payday loan service. Do whatever you want. It has nothing to do with me. Will the debt collectors come to your place? What? Why would they come to me, a stranger? That's not gonna happen. Despite his nonsensical claims, six months later he came to see me directly. I borrowed from a payday lender. It seemed he had actually borrowed and was trying to make it work. But I can't make the repayments. How much did you borrow? I borrowed enough for the short term, but then the next month's mortgage payment came and I ended up with both the payday loan and the mortgage. That's to be expected. The debt collectors are relentless. I feel like I'm going bald. Interestingly, my alopecia had settled down and my hair was growing back in. That must have been the result of my decision to get divorced. I told the debt collectors to go to you since I couldn't pay, but they refused, saying the debt was mine. That's too obvious. Please help me, I'm desperate. George banged. Why not ask your new wife for help? She already left the house. He just got married and she left that quickly? She couldn't handle the situation, and she took all the little savings, anything that looked valuable, claiming it was her share of the property. Oh dear, and now the real estate agent is telling me to leave the house. Why? That woman, she used documents without permission and sold the house on her own. She ended up running off with everything. Oh dear, your wife was smarter than you. Come on, help me out. No way. George and his mother eventually had to move into a shabby apartment. For a while, he seemed determined to find his runaway wife and recover the money from the house sale. However, despite all his efforts on the internet, he never saw her again. Eventually, tired George realized that he had to focus on repaying his debts. Despite both him and his mother working, she couldn't handle such a life and got hooked on a dating site for seniors, moving in with a man she met there and starting a new life. Quite resilient. And so, George was left with the harsh reality of his mortgage and debt collectors. He started working a night job. In addition to his day job, he resigned to his fate and focused on making regular payments. However, to make him suffer more for what he did to me, 
I demanded spousal support, which I hadn't claimed yet. $60,000. He protested, saying he couldn't pay, but when I threatened legal action through a lawyer, he somehow managed to pay. As a result, his debts increased and he's worn out. It's only fair considering how much he made me suffer. And me? I'm still working, vowing not to fall for another foolish man who relies on a woman's earnings. Currently, I am searching for a new love. My name is Emily. Recently, my husband William got promoted and I sent him a gift to celebrate. I had been feeling something was off about him for a few months. And the day after I gave William the gift, his true colors were revealed. Hey, why was the gift I gave you yesterday just sitting in the trash? You thanked me for it when you received it yesterday. Didn't you like it? Huh? Whatever. Why do you have to check up on every little thing? It's my gift. So I can do whatever I want with it, right? Besides, it was probably some cheap stuff anyway, so I threw it out. So it looked a bit bulky, but it didn't seem like much. Was it just you trying to suck up because I got a promotion? I really can't stand that about you. I had no idea you thought of me that way. Well, you wouldn't have trashed it like that otherwise, right? But are you sure that was a good idea? Seems like you're the one who's going to have a problem. You're being too persistent. I said it's fine, so it's fine. The content seemed like paper anyway. You don't mean there was a paper and there were thousands of dollars, do you? If you're going to spend money on unnecessary stuff, you might as well spoil me more. Yeah, well, sure. If that's what you think is best. Then, just to be clear, I want you to check what was inside the gift. By the way, you just casually said you can't stand me. Did you mean that or was it just in the heat of the moment? Man, you're so annoying. I've been saying it all along. Did you seriously think I was truly in love with you? To be honest, I don't need you or our child anymore. I just got married and had a child for social status. Our daughter is already five years old, so maybe it's time to live separately. Divorce is a hassle, so let's just live apart. I'm tired of playing the husband and father role. I've made it this far in my career, so I deserve to be free. I'll pay child support so you guys manage on your own. That's pretty selfish of you, isn't it? Who was it that cried with joy when Olivia was born? When Olivia was born, who said they would cherish their family forever? To change your mind so drastically in just a few years is truly frightening. That kind of preaching is exactly what I'm tired of. So what about the gift's content? It doesn't matter anymore, right? I've already thrown it away. What? You want me to say, oh, it was just some cheap thing after all? That's the kind of annoying stuff I'm talking about. As my wife, you should just listen to what I say. Always contradicting me, saying I'm wrong. Don't you know the phrase, respect your husband? You always scold me without considering the time, place, or occasion. Don't you realize that hurts my pride? When I say no to Olivia, it means no for you too. I have to explain it out loud because you don't get it. And about not considering the time, place, or occasion, I do feel the atmosphere. I've thought about staying silent, but everyone's making faces like say something to him. Didn't you feel that? Of course not. What have you been looking at all this time? When have I ever been looked at like that? My promotion is thanks to my hard work and big, big contracts. It's not just seniority. A person like me wouldn't be annoying to others. You've never really seen me. Oh, really? Then you might be happy with what was in the gift. It might have seemed cheap, but it's not worthless to me or you. I can't speak for everyone, but here, open this one. If you still think it's pointless, I'll throw it away. Oh, so you didn't just pick it up. Having two of the same cheap things, huh? Fine, whatever. It's gonna be the same result anyway. We'll see about that. Huh? What's this doing in here? What? You mean the photos of you cheating? Don't you recognize your own face? Let me tell you then. In those photos, you're the one drooling over someone else. And I know it's you, we've been together for at least seven years. No, that's not what I mean. Why do you have this? This kind of photo should only be known to us. Oh, so you do remember? No, it's not like that. Fine. But seriously, how long are you just gonna stand there? You know, the bag with the same stuff is in the communal dumpster, right? Yeah, you're right. I can't stand here chatting with you. I gotta go now. With that, William rushed out of the entrance and headed for the dumpster. 
but it was already too late. Hey, I will ask the landlord to give me back that envelope. I just accidentally threw it out last night, but it actually contains something really important. Look, the landlord's dumbfounded face. He's frozen because you talked to him. See, he's holding the envelope you threw out and comparing the photos of you and the real you. Hey, what the hell are you staring at my photos for? Don't look at me. Give it back now. That's a terrible way to speak. You're the one breaking the rules, yet you're taking it out on the landlord. Can't believe this. And aren't you embarrassed making a scene on this busy street? Me embarrassed? That's none of your concern anymore, right? After all this, you're still worried about me? You shouldn't care about me anymore. A normal person wouldn't do what you've done. Yeah, well, a normal husband wouldn't cheat so casually either. And I think a normal husband wouldn't just throw away a gift from his wife. Right? You're the one who strayed from normal first. How can you make it sound like I'm the bad one? Are you nuts? You weren't like this before. You used to be kinder, more considerate. Why did you become so cold? Hey, I never thought I could be this cruel either. But if you think about it, you'll know why. Maybe things would have been different if you had thought about me a little more. So what, you just want to make me the bad guy? Have you ever thought that maybe you're the reason I had to do this? Can you honestly say that you're completely blameless? Don't you ever think that your actions drove me to do this? What? Are you blaming me now? That's not what I'm saying. I'm asking if you can honestly say you've done nothing wrong. You're always blaming me. Doesn't Emily have any faults? But I'm the one always getting yelled at, always feeling bad. Don't you think that's unfair? This is a completely different matter. And you know, trying to make me the bad one? You're the one at fault here. Why did you do this? What about me didn't you like, especially when we have our child? Explain it to me in a way that I can understand. If you're going to blame me, you need to explain yourself first. Don't say you too. I have all the evidence in these photos. Everything in these photos is what you dislike about me. And since you wanted a divorce, I included a lawyer's contact too. You went that far? But you need a witness, right? Who did you ask? Really? Yeah, really. That's why I gathered all this evidence. You're unbelievable as a human being. Th Isn't that obvious? I had to tell your mother first so she wouldn't be shocked. It was faster to have your mom and my mom know it. Unbelievable. To have your mom and my mom know it. Unbelievable. You're not even thinking about what happens to me. I hate your selfishness. Now I have nowhere to go back to. You've just been gathering allies for yourself. Have you ever thought about what happens to me next? Why should I think about your future? You're the one who did this without thinking. Why can't you just take responsibility for your actions? You created this situation. And yet, why am I the only one getting blamed? Oops, it's time for me to go to work. In this situation, how can I leave? Let's go inside and discuss this. It's inappropriate to talk about this here. Let's go inside and sort this out. Why? We've come this far. Why go back inside? Let's talk here. There's nothing else to talk about, right? All the evidence is here. Here is the lawyer's contact information. All that's left is for you to agree. It's the natural outcome for you. You wanted a divorce from the start. So just agree happily. Why worry? Let's just go inside already. What happens if we don't? Is there something wrong? No, not exactly, but... Then let's just talk here. It's not too cold or hot. All you need to do is agree to divorce amicably. It's not that hard, is it? If you think we can talk this out and reconcile, you're mistaken. I have no intention of getting back together with you. Honestly, I don't even want to be in the same house as you. Talking outside is all I can handle. I've been holding back all this time, so... Read between the lines. Stop talking nonsense and let's go back inside. Stop making a fuss. Just listen to me. Looks like your ride is here. Look behind you. Good morning, William. Huh? Mary, aren't you gonna say hi? She's calling your name. Huh? Emily's here too? Good morning. It's trash day today, isn't it? Can't forget about it. When I start living with William, I have to follow the rules, right? What? Yeah, Mary. The landlord here is strict about rules. If you don't follow them, you'll get scolded. Right? I'll be careful. But... 
Why have you been silent all this time, William? I came all this way. Aren't you gonna hold my hand and say good morning like usual? What's this? Mary, how do you know Emily? I was planning to keep quiet until you were officially divorced. But Emily said the divorce is happening soon, so maybe it's time to reveal the truth. Emily is your neighbor, right? When I posted on social media hoping you'd get divorced soon, she reached out to me. Since she lives next door, she offered to help with the divorce. So I sent her, sent her pictures of us together, even your sleeping face, loads of them. Ever since Emily told me, I've been looking forward to it. Why? That's how it is. I've known who you were all along. This girl openly posted your face on social media, even wishing for quick divorce. I've never seen someone so lacking in literacy. But maybe that worked in my favor. What are you talking about, Emily? Explain it to me in a way I can understand. What's literacy? What worked in your favor? Mary, it looks like the divorce is gonna happen soon. Once this guy agrees to the divorce, we're all set. Wow, Emily, that's amazing. I never thought you could make the divorce happen so quickly. Come on, William. You said your wife is boring and only cares about the child. I'm cuter, younger, and her selfishness is adorable, as you said. Hold on, Mary. If I were your husband, I would have dumped a wife like that in a heartbeat. If I had been William's wife from the start, I wouldn't have let this happen. I was disappointed when I found out William had a wife, but I was happy when you asked me for private lessons. You prefer me, right? Every time we meet, you say you like me better. So why won't you agree to the divorce? Please just stop. Why? You said you would marry me once you got promoted. You said your salary would increase and we could still have kids. I've been waiting for almost a year. My birthday is coming up. If you plan to propose, then divorce her quickly. I absolutely don't want a half-hearted proposal from a man who is still married. Look, Mary is saying it too, so just agree to it already. Mary won't wait forever, you know? A younger, prettier face is better, right? Mary will get older too, and it's better to have kids sooner rather than later. Right? Emily agrees. Look, she's saying it too. You've grown apart from your wife, haven't you? I heard your daughter is already five. Your wife can manage on her own. She's a nurse, right? She'll be fine. Here, these are the divorce papers with your wife's name. It might be easier for you to make up your mind, Mary. Why don't you have William check it? Wait, okay, here you go, William. Beh? What's wrong? The wife's name is Emily. Wait, what? Emily is William's wife? They have the same name? Stop it, enough already. What's going on? What's happening here? Watching the two, I couldn't help but burst into laughter. That was too funny. Why is Emily laughing? What's so funny? Hey, Mary, you still... Don't you get it? Huh? What? You're starting to understand, but can't put it into words, right? If you say it out loud, you'll have to admit you were deceived. I've had enough. Tell me, what have I been deceived about? I'm not just the woman next door, I'm his wife. The unattractive old lady who only cares about her child. The wife you've been mocking all this time, that's me. No way. Didn't you find it strange at all? Why would a neighbor help with a divorce? Collecting photos, what did you think that was for? Didn't you question it even once? Wait, how could I have suspected that? I trusted you completely. You chose to trust blindly. Sure, I lied, but you believed it. I never thought it would work this well. I even wondered if you'd take me seriously at all. You both must have thought you had me completely fooled. Thanks to you, I was able to collect the kind of photos William had. You didn't think such photos existed, right? Since they came from the person involved, of course I knew. That's awful. You tricked me. Sounds terrible when you put it like that. But well, you two are more reprehensible. Who cheats on their spouse knowing they're married? Thankfully, there's a system for people like you. I'll gladly use it. Don't mess with me. What you did is the worst. Lying so casually... You just said it, right? It's wrong for children to lie, but okay for adults. You teach Olivia not to lie, then what about you? You're doing the opposite of what you preach. You can't possibly think it's only okay for you. Of course not. I know I'm in the wrong too. But this was the only way. Olivia understands that. Plus, as I showed earlier, your mother and my mother know too. That's what's so annoying. Oh well, it doesn't matter anymore. 
look behind you. Uh, Mom, William, you better brace yourself. And with that, William's mother-in-law appeared from behind and slapped William's cheek. Ow! Your pain will heal if left alone. It's nothing compared to the suffering Emily and Olivia went through. Do you even realize the awful things you've done? Hey, who's this lady? You're William's mistress, right? You knew he had a family, yet you still got involved. William is at fault for approaching you, but you could have rejected him. That would have spared everyone this pain. Enough, William. Divorce Emily right now. You've seen the divorce papers, right? Divorce her for Olivia's sake, and never show your face at our house again. Why? Why are you rejecting me too, Mom? Emily and Mom have given up on me. What am I supposed to do now? I've lost my place to return to. What am I supposed to do? Hey, William. I'm here, aren't I? We can always be together. So just divorce your wife quickly, and let's be together. Shut up. It's all your fault for flirting with me in the first place. I was fully aware I had a family, yet you're the one who swayed my resolve. Everything is your fault. What? Are you kidding me? If that was the case, you shouldn't have approached me from the start. And what do you mean I flirted with you? That's ridiculous. You're the one who looked at me that way, right? Well, whatever. I'm over it. Do whatever you want. I don't care about you anymore. Bye. With that, Mary quickly left the scene. Before I knew it, the landlord had also disappeared, leaving just me, William, and his mother-in-law. That's the situation. I've said all I needed to say, so I'm going home now. Oh, William, let me tell you something. Emily has already consulted a lawyer. No matter how much you struggle, there's no escape. Be prepared for that. Come on, Emily, let's go. We need to pack your things. William, go to work. You're an adult. Emily and I will take refuge, so don't expect to see us again. Guided by his mother-in-law, I went back to my apartment to pack my things. Around noon, I received a tearful call from William, who must have gone to the office. Hey, what should I do? Mary reportedly told my boss that I've been harassing her. It's not true, but I'm about to be investigated. What do you think I should do? Hey, do you really think I can answer that? This has nothing to do with me anymore. It's a problem between you and Mary. Oh, by the way, I've been blocked, so can you pass a message to Mary? I've reported everything to your family, so make sure to pay child support. That's awful. That's how it is, so don't call me anymore. Good luck. Wait for me. I hung up the phone mid-conversation and refused to answer any further calls. Long time no see. Really, it's been a while, Emily. I'm sorry for all the trouble William has caused. It's okay. It's all settled now and you're not to blame. I appreciate you saying that. Did you manage to finalize the divorce process? Yes, I did. William got fired for falsely accusing Mary. I thought so. He was ranting about it earlier. He was ranting about that when he came to our house. He came over even though you told him not to? Yes, he did. But I didn't listen to him and called the police and even sprinkled salt on him. That's so like you, right? What about that woman? Yes, Mary's parents came with her to apologize to me. That's good. Is Olivia doing okay? Thanks to you, she's doing fine. She's managing well even without William. Recently, he's been away a lot, hasn't he? I wonder if Olivia even cares. I think so. Towards the end, she didn't even ask about her father. That's terrible of William, making his daughter feel that way. He used to be a good father, but what can we do now? I plan to live my life facing Olivia properly. I'm sorry for the trouble, but I'm relieved we can meet like this occasionally. If you ever have any trouble with Olivia, let me know. I'll help however I can. Thank you. Olivia still sees you as her beloved grandmother. I'm a doting grandmother after all. Occasionally meeting with my mother-in-law like this, we share updates and live happily. I keep Olivia's well-being as my top priority and plan to continue living that way. I'll be happy enough for both of us. I can't believe my husband, for some reason, is marrying another woman. You were saving up for our wedding, right? So that's basically my money, huh? Thanks for saving it all up. Catherine, you're such a great woman. While I'm struggling to comprehend the wedding itself, Tyler just keeps spouting nonsense. It means he stole the money I had been carefully saving for our own wedding expenses. Huh? You didn't know? I tilted my head in confusion. 
They shouldn't be able to get married so casually. I hope you find happiness. I said with a smile, leaving the detestable wedding behind. But behind that smile was a flame of revenge. I'm Catherine, 26 years old. Catherine, you're so kind, is what I've always been told since I was a child. But in reality, I just can't express my own feelings. My mother always scolded me, be strong. What do you want, Catherine? But I don't even know what I want. I just kept smiling so as not to be disliked by others. Hey, Catherine, your skirt's flipped up. Tyler said that and playfully flipped up my skirt like a gust of wind. Stop it. I held down my skirt and yelled out. My eyes might have been glaring. Success! Catherine can get angry too. That's good. You look cute even when you're mad. Tyler said with a mischievous smile. This all seemed like something out of elementary school. But both Tyler and I were college students at the time. Next time I want to see you cry. I was blushing. Tyler is a jerk, but for some reason, I was drawn to him. It was the carefree Tyler who broke me out of my always smiling, gentle shell. We started dating after graduating from college. Life with the sociable Tyler was stimulating for me who had lived a modest life. He would take me to lively places like nightclubs or summer music festivals. I started staying up late and traveling, which I never did before finishing work and heading straight home. I even enjoyed a moderate amount of alcohol. Tyler and I are complete opposites. None of his friends are as reserved as me. I was worried we were mismatched when Tyler unexpectedly proposed. Are you sure about someone like Catherine? During our engagement party, one of Tyler's drunk friends loudly asked him. Even I was concerned internally about being myself, but I never expected someone else to say it. It meant that even from others' perspective, Tyler and I didn't match. I shrank in embarrassment and sadness trying to make myself disappear. What are you talking about? If I'm going to marry someone, it has to be Catherine. Tyler's cheerful voice saved me. He chugged a beer and put his arm around my shoulder. See, she's like the traditional wives of old times, right? It's rare to find such a lady these days. I'm the type who wants to be pampered. I may not be a wonderful woman, but I want to be useful to him. I felt my cheeks getting hot. With Tyler and me as the focus, our friends were having a blast, drinking and singing. We drank until late at night in Tyler's small apartment. But really, are you okay with Catherine? She seems kind of boring, you know? As the alcohol flowed, the conversation got increasingly crude. I felt a bit uncomfortable, but slightly tipsy. I believed in Tyler's love, yet I was spectacularly betrayed. Yeah, that's my biggest problem. His friends eagerly jumped on the topic. Yet, Tyler began to boast about embarrassingly private matters, despite my pleas to stop. Your wife doesn't like this, you know, a friend teased, and Tyler puffed up his chest. I'm not a man who's whipped by his wife. He was even leaning on a female friend. Maybe I should get my nighttime care elsewhere, Tyler and the woman exchanged suggestive glances, seeming not entirely against the idea. Another friend mocked, imitating a woman's voice, this cheater, enemy of women. Anyway, I'm not married to Catherine yet, so it's technically not cheating, right? Maybe I should play around more while I still can? Tyler's joking words didn't sound like a joke. He was embracing the woman, clearly crossing a line of friendship. Tyler, you've had too much to drink. Let's take a break. I pretended to be concerned to separate them. Tyler, man, you're the worst. Cheating's not okay, married or not. A friend laughed and lectured. Though they weren't really defending me, Tyler seemed to calm down momentarily. He scratched his chin in thought, nodded, and opened a drawer in the cabinet. What he took out was a marriage certificate. Look, everyone. As you can see, I'm marrying Catherine. I love only Catherine. I would never cheat. He declared it while being terribly drunk, swaying his body unsteadily. We had filled out that marriage certificate right after he proposed. It was decided that our marriage registration and wedding would take place about a year later, on November 22nd. We would start living together after that. As Tyler declared his intention, everyone cheered and congratulated us, and I was immersed in joy. But the warmth in my heart rapidly cooled after that. I... I'm Oz. Tyler carelessly stuffed the certificate into his pocket and left the house. Several friends happily followed him. I stayed because many friends were still there. A decision I'd soon regret. 
Congratulations on your marriage. Just a few minutes later, Tyler and his friends returned, unusually high-spirited. Unbelievably, they had actually submitted the marriage certificate. We'll go to the office together, okay? Our happy promise was shattered by a drunken whim. And the next day, after the friends had left, I silently cleaned the terribly messy room. Empty cans were scattered even to the bathroom, food spills everywhere, a depressing sight. After a while, Tyler woke up, but I didn't want to see his face. As I silently cleaned, Tyler came up to me, sensing something was wrong. What's up, are you upset? It bothers me when someone isn't enjoying themselves with everyone. My friends are your friends, right? I wish you would get along with them. Thank you for cleaning up. You're such a traditional wife, always so considerate. If I'm going to marry, it has to be you, Catherine. Seriously, I love you. I was disgusted by his smooth talk, but felt my heart soften as he embraced me with his large frame. I'm really sorry about last night. I know you're not into wild parties. How about we go for a relaxed date at the aquarium next time? Yeah. Despite everything, Tyler is kind. No use crying over spilled milk. We can just make our wedding day our anniversary. I was thinking of a modest ceremony, but Tyler would probably want to invite a lot of friends. He's the type who wants to enjoy his big day in a flashy way. A wedding is a once-in-a-lifetime event. I want to make it a memorable day that will stay in our hearts forever. I started getting more excited about the wedding. Then we finally booked the wedding. But that's when Tyler's behavior began to change. You didn't really like hanging out with everyone for drinks, did you? You don't have to force yourself anymore. I'll go by myself. Tyler still hangs out a lot with his friends, but... He stopped inviting me. I'm grateful, but also worried because there are many women among his friends. It's okay. I want to go with you. No, you don't have to come. The vibe gets bad when you are around, not getting into the mood. Sorry, but I don't like it when you drink until late at night with lots of girls around. Tyler, usually so cheerful, turns serious. Who do you think you are? Acting like you own me? If you keep buttoning in, we can break up right now. I clamped my mouth shut. Is it really okay for us to move forward like this? Are you really okay getting married? Even my mom, who I hadn't consulted, started to worry. Maybe my anxiety was showing. It's okay, I replied with a smile, but my mom didn't smile back. I think he's a really nice guy, sociable, but you're the one who knows him best, Catherine. Don't you think there's something off? You know the saying? Keep both eyes open before marriage and one eye closed after. You need to really see Tyler clearly now. It's okay, it's okay. I interrupted her. His brightness, which I lack, is attractive. He's shown me so many new worlds. And don't worry about the wedding expenses. I've been saving up. I'm not a kid anymore, and I won't be a burden to you, Mom. There's nothing to worry about. I didn't want to trouble my always anxious mother any further. I'm no longer a child to be scolded by my parents. Tyler and I will be fine. I kept repeating that in my mind. Then recently, the usually cold Tyler suddenly became kind. Catherine is really a good woman, he said. I blushed at his heartfelt words. I had no doubts that we would smoothly proceed to our wedding. But then one Sunday, I received a strange call from one of Tyler's friends. The wedding has started. Aren't you coming, Catherine? Forget the past, let's all drink together. Our wedding was still a long way off. It sounded like a casual invitation. Maybe another drinking party to celebrate us. I asked for the location and rushed there. What I saw was beyond comprehension. A real wedding was happening. Tyler, dressed in a tuxedo, was being congratulated as the groom. A rented restaurant was filled with friends, all merry with drinks. As I froze at the entrance, one of his friends cheerfully approached me. You're late, he said. Tyler, in a great mood, frowned. Hey, look, an uninvited woman showed up. Next to him, the bride, Katie. One of his friends laughed loudly. I remember once at a drinking party, Tyler and Katie were getting too cozy. Their closeness was uncomfortable, but now it all makes sense. Looking around the venue, I found Tyler and Katie looking demure. This wasn't a bad joke. It was a real wedding. What's going on? I managed to ask in a shaky voice. Tyler, without a hint of remorse, answered casually. It's a wedding. You thought we were still dating? You're joking, right? Tyler laughed so hard, he held his stomach. 
Wow, you're really naive. You're perfect for our wedding. Naive and easy to manipulate. Tyler patted my back mockingly. Then he whispered in my ear, I really loved you, you know? Because you're such a good woman. A woman like you I've never met before. Normally those would be sweet words, but they felt so sarcastic. But you know, it's boring. You're happy being called a good woman? Hilarious. It means you're convenient, you know? I only dated you for fun, but in the end, you were just about the money. Thanks, Catherine. Your money made this fancy wedding possible. His words hit me like a lightning bolt. Could it be? No, that's impossible. But I couldn't be hesitant anymore. The unbelievable was happening. Did you use my savings? Bingo. Embarrassed, sad, but more than anything, furious. A boiling rage surged up from within me. I'd never hated someone so much in my life. Hey, you are saving for our wedding, right? So it's my money, right? Thanks for hoarding it for me. You're really a good woman, Catherine. Tyler's words were like a slap in the face. I'll be happy enough for both of us. I understood what Tyler meant. But it was absurd. Huh? You didn't know? I tilted my head and just stated the fact. You can't marry Katie, you know? Tyler looked clueless, making me burst into laughter. He's the naive one. The wedding, more like an extension of a drinking party, was loud, but everyone was dressed up. I, crashing in casual clothes, must have looked like a pathetic ex-girlfriend. Tyler's parents, whom I met for a marriage introduction just half a year ago, glared at me openly. Couldn't they see Tyler's untrustworthiness? His friends were no different. I realized the absurdity of Tyler's surroundings. Hope you find happiness, I said with a smile, leaving the detestable wedding behind. But behind that smile, I was burning with thoughts of revenge. Thirty minutes later, Tyler trudged back to his apartment. I had anticipated this, so I was waiting in front of his place. As soon as he saw me, Tyler lunged at me. Why did you do that? He asked, do what? I replied, the marriage. Why am I married to you? He thought I had somehow interfered, so he immediately submitted the marriage registration with Katie at the office. But of course it was too late. You're the one who got married on your own, I said. You controlling woman. Quiet on the outside but doing crazy stuff. Tyler with teary eyes had a red swollen cheek. He had probably been hit by Katie. It's you who did things on your own, Tyler, I continued. You're the one who submitted the marriage certificate. Duh, why would I do such a thing? Tyler asked. I thrust my smartphone in his face and played a video. It showed the day Tyler and I registered our marriage. I'll make Catherine happy for a lifetime. He was shouting something unimaginable in the current situation. A drunk Tyler and his friends had submitted the marriage certificate on a whim, an undeniable fact. And he had completely forgotten about this significant life event. No way. Tyler snatched my phone and repeatedly watched the short video. This video had been posted on social media by one of his friends. It was one of those posts that automatically delete after 24 hours. So by the time Tyler and his friends sobered up, it was no longer visible. Reluctantly but technically, it was our marriage registration day. Thinking it would become a funny story years later, I had saved the video. But the power of self-deception is scary. I never imagined Tyler had forgotten he was married. Love is blind, they say, but my eyes were severely clouded. Tyler, always appearing fun and sparkling, was just an irresponsible, flippant man. Get a divorce quickly, I exclaimed. Why should I be married to someone like you? Tyler started to throw a fit, shifting all the blame. I regretted marrying such a man, but what's done is done. Might as well use this situation. This situation is fine, but I have a condition. Tyler fell silent for a moment. Return my money? It's an obvious request. But Tyler approached me, his face red with anger. Huh? I already spent it. You're such a miser. Like I said before, you were saving for our wedding, right? So it's my money. Well, the bride changed, huh? When I checked online banking, Tyler had taken over 60000 on. This was not just the money saved since our engagement, but what I had been saving since starting work. It's not your money. It's theft, I said firmly. Then a voice came from behind. It's not theft. Turning around, Katie was there. Tyler quickly covered his swollen cheek, but Katie seemed to be in a good mood again. They had apparently had a dispute about not being able to marry, but Katie had come back to Tyler. 
What? You didn't know? If a family member takes money from another family member, it's not theft. Katie, looking like she couldn't even do multiplication, smugly displayed her knowledge. Tyler, you're lucky. Being married saved you. Theft is when you steal someone else's money. If it's a husband taking his wife's money, it's okay. The police won't arrest you. There's no reason to return it. Tyler's expression brightened. Really? Mom said the same thing when she stole all our savings and ran off with some guy. What a joke. I didn't see the humor, but Tyler and Katie were rolling with laughter. It dawned on me then. Tyler and I live in completely different worlds, even in what we find funny. Hey, I want to know something. How did you withdraw the money? Tyler puffed out his chest and explained, Remember when you told me you were saving money for our wedding? I almost laughed at how serious you were. But then I thought, if you're saving for me, I should take it, right? So I borrowed your passbook. Tyler had grown bored of me despite our engagement, but he found me useful. When he was being kind to me for a while, he had been searching my room for the passbook. He apparently peeked at my pin when I was using the ATM. I see. Tyler bowed his head slightly. Thanks for marrying me. This $30,000 is like a wedding gift to me and Katie, right? I asked again, determined. So, how did you withdraw the money? I checked the transactions, and it looks like $30,000 was withdrawn all at once at the bank. Maybe Tyler disguised himself as a woman and went to the bank, but that would be too obvious. The only other person who could withdraw the money was Katie. High amounts usually require ID verification, right? Don't tell me someone impersonated you. Someone impersonated me? Katie visibly reacted. Then she confessed without remorse. I went in with no makeup and a mask, and nobody suspected a thing. Plain faces have no personality, so we all look the same. But honestly, walking outside without makeup was so embarrassing. I can't believe you show your plain face like that, Catherine. I couldn't stand it. Katie laughed heartily. She obviously didn't have the knowledge she pretended to have. I see. So that means you're also a thief, Katie? Even if Tyler can't be charged because he's family, you're a stranger. So, the police would arrest you, right? Tyler and Katie exchanged a look and murmured in agreement as their faces turned pale. I didn't do anything. I'm innocent. Katie quickly denied everything. But I showed them my smartphone. I've been recording everything. Katie's face went pale and she slumped. She finally gave in and hung her head. Sorry, she muttered softly. Sorry, sorry, please forgive me. I just did what Tyler told me. I didn't mean any harm. We needed money to get married, so I just... Don't make it sound like I'm the bad guy. It was Katie who complained about not having money. I just came up with a plan to take Catherine's money. You said Catherine never gets angry, no matter what. This is different. Why do I have to be the thief? I thought Catherine would just sulk and that'd be the end of it. I didn't expect this either. It seemed I had been greatly underestimated. Enough. This is getting confusing. Just wait, Catherine. Divorce me, and I'll pay you back little by little later. No way. I can't trust a thief. I'll divorce you any time, but only after you return all the money. Tyler clenched his teeth. Katie let out a shriek. Divorce quickly. We can't get married otherwise. I got married to Tyler on his own accord, and I want to divorce too. But only after I get my money back. There's no way we can return $30,000. You are young. If you work hard together, you two can save $60,000 quickly. I did it alone, after all. We don't have time for that. I'm pregnant. It turned out Tyler planned to have fun before our wedding, but he got his fling pregnant, so I was unceremoniously dumped. Apparently, they had no money, not even for the wedding, moving into a new apartment, or even childbirth expenses. You were really careless to get pregnant. Don't you think about the future? Once the child is born, you can't prioritize yourself anymore. It's not just about having fun, you know? I couldn't help but throw some common sense at the irresponsible couple. I felt like a concerned aunt. Will these kids be all right? I wondered, feeling pity. The child is innocent, but that doesn't mean I'll forgive Tyler and Katie. Katie, once so bold, started crying and Tyler lay prostrate on the concrete ground. After that, I turned Tyler and Katie over to the police. Family theft might not be criminally chargeable, but civil litigation is another matter. 
I wasn't going to let them off easily. Then there was the infidelity during marriage. And since Tyler got his affair partner Katie pregnant, I demanded alimony too. I even claimed the cancellation fee for our wedding. I have no money, why are you trying to milk me dry? Tyler cried out in anger, but I told him, this is how the real world works. If everyone lived as selfishly as Tyler, the world would fall apart. The $60,000 Katie's father fronted was safely returned. With the money returned and Katie showing remorse, she got a suspended sentence. Of course, I am also demanding alimony from Katie for the affair. Ruining people's happiness for fun? You have a terrible personality. How much money do you want? A heavily pregnant Katie confronted me. I thought she came to apologize, but instead she said this. It's only right to get back the money that was stolen. And I didn't demand alimony because as I wanted more money. Katie, you are the one who did wrong, and you have to pay the money you owe. I responded politely, but Katie just wailed and cried. After getting the $60,000 back, I divorced Tyler. Tyler and Katie apparently got married, but their honeymoon period was anything but sweet. They had no money and were living with Katie's father. He paid the $60,000 and was making sure they repaid it by watching them strictly. Both worked at a factory owned by a friend of Katie's father, not allowed to slack off or enjoy any entertainment. Katie being healthy wasn't given a break until just before childbirth. Tyler tried to escape several times, but was caught and returned to this prison. Tyler and Katie blamed each other for their predicament. I heard from Katie's father, who pays me monthly. I wish I could just get rid of a, a daughter like that. But the unborn child is innocent, and I have to make sure Catherine gets her payments. Katie's mother had run away with family money and a lover, so her father had a strong aversion to his daughter doing something similar. Tyler's parents were unreliable, so I was grateful for Katie's father's help. After such harsh treatment, heartbroken, I returned to my parents' house. I expected comfort from my mother, but she scolded me instead. Pull yourself together. Tears welled up in my eyes. I had taken my mother's unconditional acceptance for granted. My mother gently hugged me as I tried to hold back tears. Catherine, you're kind. Being quiet and nice isn't bad, but you have to value your own feelings too. I had been putting on a brave face to confront Tyler and Katie. The tears I had been holding back flowed freely. Mom, I'm sorry. It's okay, you did well. I had always been afraid of my stern mother. I avoided her, not wanting to be scolded at this age. But she has always been my biggest supporter. I spent some time at my parents' home, feeling like a child again. I ate my mother's delicious cooking to my heart's content, and fought with my father over watching sports programs. I wanted to stay with them forever, but I moved out to live on my own. I want to build a new family someday. I've always avoided trying new things, but now I'm determined to actively move forward. 